Thirteen. A whisper of love, a whisper of hate. La partie continue, announced the chef impressively. Un bon con de trente deux millions. The spectators craned forward. The chief hit the shoe with a flat-handed slap that made it rattle. As an afterthought, he took out his benzedrine inhaler and sucked the vapor up his nose. Filthy brute, said Mrs. Dupont on Bond's left. Bond's mind was clear again. By a miracle, he had survived a devastating wound. He could feel his armpits still wet with the fear of it, but the success of his gambit with the chair had wiped out all memories of the dreadful valley of defeat through which he had just passed. He had made a fool of himself. The game had been interrupted for at least ten minutes, and delay unheard of in a respectable casino. But now the cards were waiting for him in the shoe. They must not fail him. He felt his heart lift at the prospect of what was to come. It was two o'clock in the morning. Apart from the thick crowd round the big game, play was still going on at three of the men de fair games and at the same number of roulette tables. In the silence round his own table, Bond suddenly heard a distant croupier in tone. Neuf! Le rouge gang! Impère et manque! Was this an omen for him? Or for Le Chiffre. The two cards slithered towards him across the green sea. Like an octopus under a rock, Le Chiffre watched him from the other side of the table. Bond reached out a steady right hand and drew the cards towards him. Would it be the lift of the heart which a nine brings? Or an eight brings? He fanned the two cards under the curtain of his hand. The muscles of his jaw rippled as he clenched his teeth. His whole body stiffened in a reflex of self-defense. He had two queens. Two red queens. They looked rougeously back at him from the shadows. They were the worst. They were nothing. Zero. Baccarat. A card, said Bond, fighting to keep the hopelessness out of his voice. He felt Le Chief's eyes boring into his brain. The banker slowly turned his own two cards face up. He had a count of three. A king and a black three. Bond softly exhaled a cloud of tobacco smoke. He still had a chance. Now he was really faced with the moment of truth. Le Chief slapped the shoe, slipped out a card. Bond's fate, and slowly turned it face up. It was a nine. A wonderful nine of hearts. The card known in gypsy magic as a whisper of love, a whisper of hate. The card that meant almost certain victory for Bond. The croupier slipped it delicately across. To the sheaf it meant nothing. Bond might have had a one, in which case he now had ten points. Or nothing. Or baccarat, as it is called. Or he might have had a two, three, four, or even five. In which case, with the nine, his maximum count would be four. Holding a three and giving a nine is one of the moot situations at the game. The odds are so nearly divided between to draw or not to draw. Bond let the banker sweat it out. Since his nine could only be equaled by the banker drawing a six, he would normally have shown his count if it had been a friendly game. Bond's cards lay on the table before him, the two impersonal pale pink patterned backs and the faced nine of hearts. To the sheaf the nine might be telling the truth, or many variations of lies. The whole seat lay in the reverse of the two pink backs where the pair of queens kissed the green cloth. The sweat was running down either side of the banker's beaky nose. His thick tongue came out slyly and licked a drop out of the corner of his red gash of a mouth. He looked at Bond's cards, then at his own, and then back at Bond's. Then his whole body shrugged and he slipped out a card for himself from the lisping shoe. He faced it. The table craned. It was a wonderful card. A five. Huit de la banque, said the croupier. As Bond sat silent, the chief suddenly grinned wolfishly. He must have won. The croupier's spatula reached almost apologetically across the table. There was not a man at the table who did not believe Bond was defeated. The spatula flicked the two pink cards over onto their backs. The gay red queens smiled up at the lights. Et le neuf! A great gasp went up round the table, and then a hubbub of talk. Bond's eyes were on Le Chiffre. The big man fell back in his chair as if slugged above the heart. His mouth opened and shut once or twice in protest, and his right hand felt at his throat. Then he rocked back. His lips were grey. As the huge stack of plaques was shunted across the table to Bond, the banker reached into an inner pocket of his jacket and threw a wad of notes onto the table. Un bon con de dix millions, he announced. He slapped down their equivalent in ten plaques of a million each. This is the kill, thought Bond. This man has reached the point of no return. This is the last of his capital. He has come to where I stood an hour ago, and he is making the last gesture that I made. But if this man loses, there is no one to come to his aid. No miracle to help him. Bond sat back and lit a cigarette. On a small table beside him, half a bottle of clinquois and a glass had materialized. Without asking who the benefactor was, Bond filled the glass to the brim and drank it down in two long draughts. Then he leant back with his arms curled forward on the table in front of him like the arms of a wrestler, seeking a hold at the opening of a boo of jujitsu. The players on his left remained silent. Bonko, he said, speaking straight at Le Chiffre. Once more, the two cards were borne over to him, and this time the croupier slipped them into the green lagoon between the outstretched arms. 
Bond curled his right hand in, glanced briefly down, and flipped the cards face up in the middle of the table. Le neuf, said the croupier. The chief was gazing down at his own two black kings. Et le baccarat, and the croupier eased across the table the fat tide of plaques. The chief watched them go to join the serried millions in the shadow of Bond's left arm. Then he stood up slowly, and without a word he brushed past the players to the break in the rail. He unhooked the velvet-covered chain and let it fall. The spectators opened a way for him. They looked at him curiously and rather fearfully as if he carried the smell of death on him. Then he vanished from Bond's sight. Bond stood up. He took a hundred-meal plaque from the stacks beside him and slipped it across the table to the chef de partie. He cut short the effusive thanks and asked the croupier to have his winnings carried to the case. The other players were leaving their seats. With no banker there could be no game, and by now it was half past two. He exchanged some pleasant words with his neighbors to the right and left and then ducked under the rail to where Vesper and Felix Leiter were waiting for him. Together they walked over to the case. Bond was invited to come into the private office of the casino directors. On the desk lay his huge pile of chips. He added the contents of his pockets to it. In all, there was over 70 million francs. Bond took Felix Leiter's money in notes and took a check to cash on the Crédit Lyonnais for the remaining 40-odd million. He was congratulated warmly on his winnings. The directors hoped that he would be playing again that evening. Bond gave an evasive reply. He walked over to the bar and handed Leiter's money to him. For a few minutes, they discussed the game over a bottle of champagne. Leiter took the forty-five bullet out of his pocket and placed it on the table. I gave the gun to Matisse, he said. He's taken it away. He was as puzzled as we were by the spill you took. He was standing at the back of the crowd with one of his men when it happened. The gunman got away without difficulty. You can imagine how they kicked themselves when they saw the gun. Matisse gave me this bullet to show you what you escaped. The nose has been cut with a dum-dum cross. You'd have been in a terrible mess. But they can't tie it onto the sheaf. The man came in alone. They've got the form he filled up to get his entrance card. Of course, it'll all be phony. He got permission to bring the stick in with him. He had a certificate for a war wound pension. These people certainly get themselves well organized. They've got his prints and they're on the bolinograph to Paris, so we may hear more about him in the morning. Felix later tapped out another cigarette. Anyway, all is well that ends well. You certainly took Le Chiffre for a ride at the end, though we had some bad moments. I expect you did, too. Bond smiled. That envelope was the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me. I thought I was really finished. It wasn't at all a pleasant feeling. Talk about a friend in need. One day I'll try to return the compliment. He rose. I'll just go over to the hotel and put this away, he said, tapping his pocket. I don't like wandering around with his chief's death warrant on me. He might get ideas. Then I'd like to celebrate a bit. What do you think? He turned to Vesper. She had hardly said a word since the end of the game. Shall we have a glass of champagne in the nightclub before we go to bed? It's called the Roi Galant. You get to it through the public rooms. It looks quite cheerful. I think I'd love to, said Vesper. I'll tidy up while you put your winnings away. I'll meet you in the entrance hall. What about you, Felix? Bond hoped he could be alone with Vesper. Leiter looked at him and read his mind. I'd rather take a little rest before breakfast, he said. It's been quite a day, and I expect Paris will want me to do a bit of mopping up tomorrow. There are several loose ends you won't have to worry about. I shall. I'll walk over to the hotel with you. Might as well convoy the treasure ship right into port. They strolled over through the shadows cast by the full moon. Both had their hands on their guns. It was three o'clock in the morning, but there were still several people about, and the courtyard of the casino was still lined with motor cars. The short walk was uneventful. At the hotel, Leiter insisted on accompanying Bond to his room. It was as Bond had left it six hours before. No reception committee, observed Leiter, but I wouldn't put it past them to try a last throw. Do you think I ought to stay up and keep you two company? You get your sleep, said Bond. Don't worry about us. They won't be interested in me without the money, and I've got an idea for looking after that. Thanks for all you've done. I hope we get on a job again one day. Suits me, said Leiter, so long as you can draw a nine when it's needed. And bring Vesper along with you, he added dryly. He went out and closed the door. Bond turned back to the friendliness of his room. After the crowded arena of the big table and the nervous strain of the three hours' play, he was glad to be alone for a moment and be welcomed by his pajamas on the bed and his hairbrushes on the dressing table. He went into the bathroom and dashed cold water over his face and gargled with a sharp mouthwash. He felt the bruises on the back of his head and on his right shoulder. He reflected cheerfully how narrowly he had twice that day escaped being murdered. Would he have to sit up all that night and wait for them to come again? Or was the chief even now on his way to Le Havre or Bordeaux to pick up a boat for some remote corner of the world where he could escape the eyes and guns of Smirsch? Bond shrugged his shoulders. Sufficient unto that day had been its evil. He gazed for a moment into the mirror and wondered about Vesper's morals. He wanted her cold and arrogant body. He wanted to see tears and desire in her remote blue eyes and to take the ropes of her black hair in his hands and bend her body under him. Bond's eyes narrowed, and his face in the mirror looked back at him with hunger. He turned away and took out of his pocket this check for 40 million francs. He folded this very small. Then he opened the door and looked up and down the corridor. He left the door wide open and with his ears cocked for footsteps or the sound of the lift, he set to work with a small screwdriver. Five minutes later, he gave a last minute survey to his handiwork, put some fresh cigarettes in his case, closed and locked the door and went off down the corridor across the hall and out into the moonlight.